Hi, this is Brad Linder with Little Computing and LinuxSmartphones.com, a new website that I started recently, uh, partly because of this phone, which just arrived. This is my first Linux smartphone. It's the Pine64 Postmarket OS Community Edition phone. This is the convergence package that I uh, just ordered recently for about $200, and it just arrived. And so I'm going to do a little unboxing and just sort of a first look. And uh, stay tuned. In the future, I'll have more videos showing how to use it and some of the uh, the features that are available. So this is a inexpensive phone. Sells for really just a starting price of $150, but uh, the version that I have here is slightly more expensive because it has a little bit more memory and storage and comes with a convergence dock that allows you to use this Linux phone like a Linux computer. So inside, we've got a little bit of documentation. So there's introducing post-market OS, a little bit of information about that and about Pine64, and then some information the user manual, quick start guide, and so forth. And here is the phone and the convergence dock. So first thing I'll point out here is that this is basically a little USB type C docking station that as you can see has ports for ethernet, HDMI, and two USB ports. And so the idea is you can plug this into your phone and you can actually charge it while it's plugged in by putting another uh, charging cable right in there. And you can connect an external display, a keyboard, a mouse, uh, even Ethernet, and use the system as a computer. Because in addition to being able to run a variety of different Linux-based operating systems for phones, it can basically run Linux desktop software as well. So we've got the phone, and we've got a charging cable or data transfer cable, but no charging brick. So the idea is, uh, odds are by now, if you're ordering a phone like this, you've probably already got something to charge it. So we've got uh, USB type C on one end, USB type A on the other, and you can use this with probably most smartphone charging bricks. And here is the phone itself. It's uh, got about a six inch screen. It's a 720p display, uh, you know, not the super highest resolution, obviously, but again, it's a relatively inexpensive device made uh, to make this whole idea and this experience pretty user accessible. It has the post-market OS uh, edition on the back, so it's powered by Linux. And while it ships with uh, certain different operating systems, there are various versions of this phone. This is the post-market OS version. There's been an Ubuntu version, a Manjaro edition is uh, on the way. Um, the idea is that it's not locked down in any way. So you should be able to replace the operating system with just about anything that you would like. Um, the standard model for 150 has two gigs of RAM and 32 gigs of storage and an all winner A64 quad core processor. This model has three gigs of RAM and 32 gigs of storage, and that's because it's meant to be used with that uh, desktop docking station. Uh, in terms of build, it's decent. I mean, it's, it's uh, got a nice plastic feel to it. Um, feels sturdy. Okay in the hand. It's a little bit larger than phones I usually use, um, but at this point, I'm shooting this video in uh, October of 2020, the software is still a work in progress for the most part, so I'm not sure that most people are using these as their daily driver phones anyway. So as more of a Linux test bed, uh, sort of a handheld tablet type device, I think a six inch screen is fine. Uh, I prefer something a little bit smaller for fitting in my pocket because um, I don't have huge hands. And, uh, let's go ahead and take off the screen protector here. And there's a little bit of, you can sort of see around the edges. Now oh, there's a, a screen protector that's actually applied. So that was just the plastic over it. Looks like it comes pre-applied with a plastic screen protector that I could probably peel off, but I'm gonna leave it on for now because I can see around the edges that there's a little bit of fraying there. We've got power and volume buttons, a headset jack, and a USB type C port down here at the bottom, as well as a microphone uh, speaker on the back. And before I turn it on, I'm going to put my finger in this little sort of groove here and remove the back cover if I can. Because that's actually the first step you need to do before turning this on, because there's a little bit of plastic there over the battery. So unlike a lot of uh, modern smartphones, this does have a removable battery. Theoretically, if I can pop it out. And they're pretty tight.
right back. Alright, took a little bit of digging, but I got the uh, battery to pop off, so there seems to be a little bit of adhesive down here, which I had not been anticipating. But uh, now that the battery is off, I can remove this sticker and then reinsert the battery, and that should allow me to power on the device. Before I do that, I'm going to point out a couple of other things that are on the back here. We've got a uh, SIM card slot, an SD card reader, and kill switches that you can uh, adjust using a sort of a fine tip, uh, whatever you've got, to enable or disable the modem, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, microphone, rear camera, front camera, or a headphone. So this is one of the things that really makes PinePhone different from most smartphones is that you've got these hardware kill switches. There's also these little pogo pin connectors here, which can be used theoretically for uh, other sort of hardware attachments. Uh, so this is really designed to be a pretty hacker-friendly device. Um, I'm not going to go ahead and insert a SIM card or a uh, SD card right now, but one nice thing about this is that it should be able to boot from an SD card, so you don't have to replace the operating system that's pre-installed to try something different. And uh, I do have a spare data-only SIM that I might try with this in the not-too-distant future. So let's go ahead and snap that case back on. Seems pretty secure. And let's see what happens when we press and hold the power button. There we go. So we've got the post-market OS loading screen here. I don't know if you can hear it. There's construction going on in the house next to mine, so it's not ideal timing for, uh, for shooting this video, but I didn't want to wait. And so this is the first boot experience. It's saying that we're about to install post-market OS version 20.5 or 0 0.05, which is what shipped with this. Uh, Pine64 Pine Phone using the uh, Fosh user interface, which was developed by the folks at uh, Purism for the Librem 5 smartphone. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and follow the startup and uh, walk through the process and go ahead and set up my phone. Okay, let's see. So it allows you to set up a SSH server so that you should be able to connect later. I'm just going to skip that for now. Full disk encryption, we can enable or disable. Uh, for security purposes, this is probably a good idea, um, but just to get through this process. So that's what it takes to get to the uh, install. So I'm actually going to go ahead and do this, which is going to take me a few minutes. But I just wanted to do a first look video of the Pine phone and the setup experience, and I'll be back later, once I've uh, made sure the back is snapped into place properly, I'll be back later with some more videos showing you uh, sort of first impressions of the Pine phone running post-market OS, and then maybe try some different operating systems and show you what it can and cannot do. And I'm back because it didn't actually take very long to set up the phone, so I'm just going to show you a first look at post-market OS running on the Pine phone. So we've got a lock screen here, enter the passcode, and unlock, and that should let us in. And we've got this sort of desktop here. We can go up from the bottom to see our list of installed applications, or tap from the top to view our notifications, or um, notifications and sort of quick settings here, so we can adjust the wireless controls, uh, and volume and brightness, and so forth. Now, what's interesting here is that doesn't go away unless you tap the top again. So first time you load the device, you'll actually be greeted by this welcome screen that shows you how to use it. And if you open the notifications, you'll notice you can actually scroll through this and it's just sort of covered by that screen. So that's something that takes a little while to get used to and shows, again, that I think mobile is uh, mobile Linux is still very much a work in progress. So now that we've got an application running, just that welcome app, you can see that we've also got a sort of recent applications area here. So if I wanted to open the Firefox web browser, you can see it takes a moment to open, but once it does, now I've got two apps and I can switch back and forth and I can uh, close them by putting, hitting the X button.
And you can see it works pretty much the way you expect a web browser to work. It's not perfectly smooth. Scrolling's a little bit slow here, but it supports pinch to zoom and other basic functions like that. And I can open up another window. I can open up a second website. I can realize that I mistyped the website. And what's a little bit weird here, and maybe there's a workaround for this, but I haven't figured it out yet, is selecting all of the text in there. There we go. Is a little bit tricky. There we go. So typing on the on-screen keyboard works, scrolling works, again, pinch to zoom works. Uh, so there's your basic functionality. Now, because this is a Linux distribution, it also comes with the terminal application. So I can load that here. We can look through the file system using commands like ls. Uh, I could run top. And I can even open up new windows, use keyboard shortcuts, etc. And if you wanted to close while an application is running, you'll even get this message asking if it's OK if it terminates that application. Likewise, if I want to close the web browser, it'll ask if it's OK if I want to close multiple tabs. Now, I think everything just crashed, which uh, has happened to me a few times. But now you notice that there are no applications running, even though uh, there should have been one or two left running in the background. Uh, there's a software application area here where you can see your installed applications. You can look for new apps that are available to install. Should be able to un uninstall apps this way as well and find updates that are available. We've got a calculator, clock, and not a lot of other software out of the box. Uh, the version of the software that it's shipping with doesn't seem to have a working camera application, even though we've got a front and a rear camera. But camera uh, software does seem to be in development and is getting a lot better for the Pine phone. So I'm looking forward to trying out the Megapixels application, for example, that's under development and is supposed to be pretty good. Uh, so let's go ahead and close everything out here. I'll show you that from this menu, I can also go to uh, power off, restart, or lock screen, or I can just turn off the screen by pressing the power button. And one last thing I didn't show you is the settings application, which again is designed to be friendly for uh, touchscreen devices here. So it looks a lot like what you would see in something like Android, um, but the menus are all sort of set up here to access various settings. So again, this is post-market OS running on the Pine phone. It's just one of many operating systems available for the Pine phone. And it's very much a work in progress. I'm not sure that it's ready to use as your daily smartphone, but it's designed to, uh, to theoretically let you do that at some point in the future. And the Pine phone is designed to run software like this. And this version that I'm testing is the post-market OS community edition, which was designed uh, specifically to ship with post-market OS, as you can see from the, uh, the logo on the box. So this is Brad Linder with linuxsmartphones.com and lilliputing.com. You can check out those websites for more information or subscribe to our YouTube channel for more updates and information as I uh, post it.